Welcome to the Word Podcast. The Lord God has given us His Word. Let us learn it. Let us live it. Let us rejoice in it. Spread the Word. Blessings, everyone. How are you doing today? I'm Dale. Thank you so much for joining with me today on the Word Podcast. I want to pick up a thought that we've been looking at in the last couple of episodes, uh, really a, a topical kind of idea that you see throughout the Scripture, and it's a little phrase, love one another. And we saw yesterday in John 15 that Jesus gave them a new commandment. He said it in the 12th verse, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Now, th- this goes beyond, I really want to sort of drive this home in all of our minds and all of our spirits. That this isn't just an intellectual ascent to a truth, okay? This is how we as believers are to be living. And if we read this, and if we're not loving one another, and it doesn't uh, change us, if it doesn't transform us, if it doesn't conform us to His image and to His likeness, if we don't start going down the path that the Lord instructed and commanded us, then I think some things are being revealed. And you sort of see that in the balance of this chapter. So I want to read a portion of this chapter today. I'm not sure if we'll get through the rest of it, but we may. Because it's really important to see. Uh, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I just, well, I know I have to love them, but I don't have to like them. <laughs> you know, that's sort of foolish. Now, I know what you're talking about. You may not like the style of somebody's clothing. You may not like their hair. You may not like the food they like and that kind of stuff. No, 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 not that kind of foolish thing. There's plenty of diversity within the body of Christ. Yeah, but I'm talking about the love that comes only through the power of the Spirit. So listen to this. This is uh, John 15, beginning with verse 12 again. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So the Lord is showing, okay, here, the evidence that you are a friend of God the evidence that you're truly saved is that you will do what he commands to be done. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And I know a lot of us may sing a a song that's come about in the body of Christ the last mm, I think 17 years or so, called Friend of God. And that's what it's speaking of, that we are friends of God. Now, I'll tell you, uh, there were two guys that wrote that song. And I uh, actually got it from one of them uh, when I saw him at a conference when nobody knew who he was. I mean, he was an up-and-coming young whippersnapper. And I heard this song. I thought, I love this song. So I just sat there on the back and wrote down the words. And literally, (laughs) the next day at church, we did it because it spoke that I am a friend of God. The Lord declares this right here. But since then, one of the composers of that song has just sort of gone off on what I would describe politically as the deep end. And even theologically, he's just really, really in some grievous errors. But it's nothing that separates unto salvation yet. Though the way he's going, I would not be surprised if in the next couple of years that he just uh, swallows the whole hook. Okay, But the, 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 what I'm trying to say is this that there are times there are songs that I will not do in church, okay, that we will not, people say, oh, this is a great song. I know, but I know the story. I know the background, and I know where it came from, and we're just not going to do that, okay? But here the truth is that we are the friend of God because we're no longer slaves. I can still sing that song, even though I know that one of the composers uh, is probably struggling with, with the totality of the truth, that he once claimed to believe, okay? But anyway, he says, Jesus says, I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Remember we saw this in the last episode. And appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Well, why such an imperative? Why such a command to love one another? Well, and there's several reasons. Uh, one is that we're reflective of the Most High God. Okay, The world's going to see us. Remember what Jesus said in John 13, the world will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. So the world will see and the world will know that something's different. But there's also a thing there about how we live, and I believe it's preparatory because of what the next verse says. Again, verse 17, this I command you, 
that you love one another. The very next verse, and this is Jesus speaking, he says this, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now, most believers will say, well, yeah, yeah, I know that the world is going to hate us. I know that we're going to undergo trials and tribulations and suffering and afflictions. I know what Paul told Timothy at the end of Paul's life. He said, all who desire to be Christ-like will undergo these type of things. I know that. But, you know, there's something interesting within the context right here. I think Jesus is letting them know the world's going to hate you. And the world's going to hate you because it hated me. But you're not alone. And we're going to see it at the end of the chapter, which by now I realize we're not going to get to. But, you know, I'll tell you what, we'll chase this little rabbit a couple more episodes. Uh, we have the Most High God, okay? The world hates us, but we have the Lord. The world hates us, we have the Lord dwelling within us, the Holy Spirit. The world hates us, we have one another. And if the one another is not functioning in the way that it's supposed to be, then we're going to be missing a major element. So he says, this I command you, that you love one another, if the world hates you, you know that it's hated me before it hated you. And we're not alone in the world hating us. We can encourage and exhort one another. Verse 19, he continues. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Now, boy, there's some powerful things right here because we see again that the Lord has chosen us out of the world. And because we're chosen out of the world, the world hates us. And you actually see this within the organizational body of Christ. You'll see people who hate the understanding and the overt truth all the way through Scripture that the Lord chooses. Now, I can understand them hating not being able to understand it, <laughs> okay, and being able to explain all the elements and everything that we often want to do as humans. No, that's not what the issue is. The issue is this. That the truth is, the Lord says he chose you out of the world, but the world hates you because of this. Those that are in the organizational church, the religionists that aren't truly saved but are of the world, hate that. They hate it. And we see it rampant within a professing portion of the body of Christ. Now, verse 20 says this, Remember the word that I said to you, A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word... They will keep yours also. Verse 21. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Now, I know sometimes people come back and say, well, he's speaking to the disciples, and this really doesn't apply to us. And it is. It's an intimate moment right here from John 14 on, because Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the last moments of his corporeal existence here upon earth. I understand that. But I also know that the balance of Scripture reveals that these truths right here are for us also. Okay, Jesus says it over in uh, John 17 later on in what's referred to as his high priestly prayer. Really the true Lord's Prayer. What we call the Lord's Prayer is really a model prayer. When the Lord's truly praying, the Father just pours out his heart is in John 17. And he talks about uh, to the Lord, he says, Lord, I want you to watch over these that are yours. Not only these, but these who also believe because of what they say. <laughs> that be us, okay? That's us. But he tells us this. He says, the world is going to do these things to you. Let me share a couple more verses right here. We'll be done. John 15, 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Boy, that right there, that's a wild thing. And it's, it's, it's sort of a parallel to what you see, what Paul said. Paul said, I, I would not have known what sin was if it wasn't for the law. The law defined what it was, okay, what the sin was. Here Jesus said, if I had not come, they would not have sinned. But since I did come, they have no excuse for their sin. What was the sin? The rejection of the salvation of the Most High God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And they had no excuse. They saw, they rejected, and they're going to be held accountable. Last verse for today, John 15, 23. He who hates me hates my father also. So what he was saying to them is, you can't sit there and say, I love God, I love God, I love God, but Jesus, I hate you. You cannot do that. I'll tell you what, we'll pick this up next time. Again, I'm Dale. Thank you so much for being with me. I'll see you.